Book Four, Chapters Sixteen to Nineteen of Commentaries on the Gallic War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar. Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes. Book Four, Chapter Sixteen. The campaign against the Germans being concluded. Caesar thought it advisable for many reasons to cross the Rhine. The most cogent reason was this. Observing that the Germans were so ready to invade Gaul, he desired to make them feel alarm on their own account, and realize that the army of the Roman people could and would cross the Rhine. There was another consideration. That division of the cavalry of the Eusepites and Tenchteri, which, as I have already related, had crossed the Meuse to plunder and forage, and had taken no part in the action, had recrossed the Rhine after the rout of their countrymen, taken refuge in the territory of the Sugambri, and joined forces with them. When Caesar sent envoys to the Sugambri, calling upon them to deliver up the fugitives on the ground that they had made war upon him and upon Gaul, they replied that the Rhine was the limit of Roman dominion. If Caesar thought that the Germans had no right to cross over into Gaul without his permission, how could he claim any authority or power beyond the Rhine? The Ubii, on the other hand, who alone among the Transrene peoples had sent envoys to Caesar, entered into friendly relations with him, and, given hostages, earnestly entreated him to help them, as they were hard-pressed by the Subii, or if he were prevented from doing so by reasons of state, merely to throw his army across the Rhine, which would be sufficient to support them and assure their prospects for the future. The name and fame which his army had gained, even with the most distant German peoples, by defeating Ariovistus, and by this recent victory, were so great that they could safely rely on the prestige and friendship of the Roman people. At the same time, they promised to provide a large flotilla of boats for the passage of the army. Caesar was determined to cross the Rhine for the reasons which I have mentioned, but he thought it hardly safe to cross in boats, and considered that to do so would not be consistent with his own dignity or that of the Roman people. Therefore, although the construction of a bridge presented great difficulties on account of the breadth, swiftness, and depth of the stream, he nevertheless thought it best to make the attempt, or else not to cross at all. The principle upon which he designed the bridge was as follows. He took a couple of piles a foot and a half thick, had them sharpened to a point from a little above the lower end, and adapted in length to the varying depth of the river, and fastened them together at an interval of two feet. These piles he caused to be lowered into the river by means of floats, fixed and driven home with pile drivers, not vertically like ordinary piles, but leaning forward in the same plane so that they followed the direction of the current. Then he had another couple of piles, similarly joined together, planted opposite them on the lower side at a distance of forty feet, against the force and rush of the current. Beams two feet wide, fitting into the interval between the piles of each couple, were laid across, and the two couples were kept apart by a pair of braces on either side of the extremity. The couples being thus kept apart, and on the other hand held firmly in place, the strength of the structure was so great, and its principle so ordered, that the greater the force of the current, the more closely were the piles locked together. The series of piles and transverse beams was connected by timbers laid in the direction of the bridge, which were floored with poles and fascines. Finally, notwithstanding the existing strength of the structure, Piles were also driven in diagonally on the downstream side, which were connected with the entire structure, and planted below like a buttress, so as to break the force of the stream. Other piles were likewise planted a little above the bridge, so that in case the natives floated down trunks of trees or barges to demolish the structure, their force might be weakened by these bulwarks, and they might not injure the bridge. Within ten days after the collection of the timber began, the whole work was finished, and the army crossed over. Caesar left a strong force at both ends of the bridge, and marched rapidly for the country of the Sugambri. Meanwhile, 
envoys came in from several tribes and caesar replied graciously to their prayer for peace and friendship and directed them to bring him hostages the sugambri on the contrary from the moment when the construction of the bridge began acting on the advice from the tenchteri and eusipides whom they were entertaining had prepared for flight left their country with all their belongings and hidden themselves in the recesses of the forest caesar remained a few days in their country burned all their villages and homesteads cut down their corn and returned to the territory of the ubii promising to help them in case they were molested by the subii he ascertained from them that the latter on learning from their scouts that the bridge was being made had called a council according to their custom and sent messengers in all directions bidding the people to abandon the strongholds convey their wives and children and all their belongings into the forest and assemble all of them who could bear arms at a fixed place nearly in the centre of the region occupied by the subii here they were awaiting the arrival of the romans and here they had determined to fight a decisive battle caesar had achieved every object for which he had determined to lead his army across overawed the germans punished the sugambri and relieved the ubii from hostile pressure he felt that honor was satisfied and that he had served every useful purpose when therefore he heard the news about the subii he returned to gaul having spent just eighteen days on the further side of the rhine and destroyed the bridge end of chapter nineteen chapters twenty through thirty eight of commentaries on the gallic war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phil chenevere commentaries on the gallic war by julius caesar translated by thomas rice holmes book four chapter twenty only a small part of the summer remained and in these parts the whole of gaul having a northerly trend winter sets in early nevertheless caesar made active preparations for an expedition to britain for he knew that in almost all the operations in gaul our enemies had been reinforced from that country besides if there were not time for a campaign he thought that it would be well worth his while merely to visit the island see what the people were like and make himself acquainted with the features of the country the harbors and the landing places for of all this the gauls knew practically nothing no one indeed readily undertakes the voyage to britain except traders and even they know nothing of it except the coast and the parts opposite the different regions of gaul accordingly though caesar summoned traders from all parts to meet him he could not ascertain the extent of the island what tribes dealt therein their strength their method of fighting, their manners and customs, or what harbors were capable of accommodating a large flotilla. To procure information on these points, before risking the attempt, he sent Gaius Volusenus, whom he considered perfectly competent, with the galley, instructing him to make a thorough reconnaissance and return as soon as possible. At the same time he marched with his whole force for the country of the Marini, as the shortest passage to Britain was from their coast and ordered ships to assemble there from all the ports in the adjacent districts as well as the fleet which he had built in the previous summer for the war with the veneti meanwhile his design became known and was reported by traders to the britons whereupon envoys came to him from several tribes of the island promising to give hostages and to submit to the authority of the roman people on hearing what they had to say caesar graciously reassured them and sent them home enjoining them to abide by their resolve along with them he sent comius whom after the overthrow of the atrebates he had set up as king over that people a man of whose energy and judgment he had a high opinion whom he believed to be loyal and who was reputed to have great influence in the country he instructed him to visit all the tribes he could to urge them to trust in the good faith of the roman people and to announce that Caesar would soon arrive. Volusenus reconnoitred all the features of the coast as far as he could get the chance, for he could not venture to disembark and trust himself to the natives, and in five days returned to Caesar and reported his observations. 
While Caesar was waiting in these parts to get his ships ready for sea, envoys came from a large section of the Marini to apologize for their recent conduct in attacking the Roman people and promise obedience to his commands, pleading that they were uncivilized and knew nothing of our ways. Caesar regarded this as most opportune, for he had no wish to leave an enemy in his rear. Owing to the time of the year he had no means of undertaking a campaign, and he did not think it wise to postpone his expedition to Britain for trivialities. Accordingly he ordered the envoys to furnish a large number of hostages, and on their arrival admitted the Morini to terms. About eighty transports, which he considered sufficient to convey two legions, were collected and assembled. The galleys, which he had besides, he assigned to the quaestor, the generals, and the auxiliary officers. Besides these, there were eighteen transports, eight miles off, which were prevented from making the same harbor by contrary winds. These he assigned to the cavalry, placing the rest of the army under the command of two generals, Quintus Titurius Sabinus and Lucius Arunculius Cotta, with orders to march against the Menapii, and those clans of the Marini, from which no envoys had come, he directed another general, Publius Sulpicus Rufus, to hold a port with a force which he considered adequate. The arrangements were now complete, and, taking advantage of favorable weather, he set sail about the third watch, directing the cavalry to march to the further harbor, embark there, and follow him. They were rather dilatory in getting through their work. But Caesar, with the leading ships, reached Britain about the fourth hour, and there, standing in full view on all the heights, he saw an armed force of the enemy. The formation of the ground was peculiar, the sea being so closely walled in by abrupt heights that it was possible to throw a missile from the ground above on to the shore. Caesar thought the place most unsuitable for landing, and accordingly remained till the ninth hour, waiting at anchor for the other ships to join him. Meanwhile he assembled the generals and tribunes, told them what he had learned from Volusenus, and explained his own plans, charging them to bear in mind the requirements of war and particularly of seamanship, involving as it did rapid and irregular movements, and to see that all orders were carried out smartly and at the right moment. The officers dispersed, and, getting wind and tied together in his favor, Caesar gave the signal, weighed anchor, and sailing on about seven miles further, ran the ships aground on an open and evenly shelving shore. The natives knew what the Romans intended, sending on ahead their cavalry and charioteers, a kind of warriors whom they habitually employ in action. They followed with the rest of their force, and attempted to prevent our men from disembarking. It was very difficult to land for these reasons. The size of the ships made it impossible for them to ground except in deep water. The soldiers did not know the ground, and, with their hands loaded and weighted by their heavy, cumbrous armor, they had to jump down from the ships, keep their foothold in the surf, and fight the enemy all at once. While the enemy had all their limbs free, they knew the ground perfectly, and, standing on dry land or moving forward a little into the water, they threw their missiles boldly and drove their horses into the sea which they were trained to enter. Our men were unnerved by the situation and having no experience of this kind of warfare they did not show the same dash and energy that they generally did in battles on land caesar noticing this ordered the galleys with the look of which the natives were not familiar and which were easier to handle to shear off a little from the transports row hard and range alongside of the enemy's flanks and slingers archers and artillery to shoot from their decks and drive the enemy out of the way this maneuver was of great service to our men, for the natives, alarmed by the build of the ships, the motion of the oars, and the strangeness of the artillery, stood still, and then drew back a little. And now, as our soldiers were hesitating, chiefly because of the depth of the water, the standard-bearer of the tenth, praying that his attempt might redound to the success of the legion, cried, Leap down, men, unless you want to abandon the eagle to the enemy. I, at all events, shall have done my duty to my country and my general. Uttering these words in a loud voice, he threw himself overboard, and advanced bearing the eagle against the enemy. Then, calling upon each other, not to suffer such a disgrace, the men leaped all together from the ship, 
Seeing this, their comrades in the nearest ships followed them and advanced close up to the enemy. Both sides fought with spirit, but the Romans, being unable to keep their ranks unbroken, or get firm foothold, or follow their respective standards, and as they came from this or that ship joining any standard they met, became greatly confused, while the enemy knew all the shallows, and when from their standpoint on shore they saw a few men disembarking one by one, urged on their horses, and surrounding the little group in numbers, attacked them before they were ready. Others again got on the exposed flank of an entire company, and plied them with missiles. Caesar, noticing this, ordered the men of war's boats, and also the scouts, to be manned, and whenever he saw any of his men in difficulties, sent them to the rescue. Our men, as soon as they got upon dry land, followed by all their comrades, charged the enemy and put them to flight, but could not pursue them far, because the cavalry had not been able to keep their course and make the island. This was the only drawback to Caesar's usual good fortune. The beaten enemy, on rallying after their flight, at once sent envoys to Caesar to sue for peace, promising to give hostages and to obey his commands. The envoys were accompanied by the Atrebatian Comius, who, as I have already related, had been sent on by Caesar to Britain in advance. He had just landed, and, in the character of an envoy, was conveying Caesar's mandates to the Britons, when they seized him and locked him with chains. But now, after the battle, they sent him back, and, while suing for peace, laid the blame of the outrage upon the rabble, and begged that it might be overlooked in consideration of their ignorance. Caesar complained that, after the Britons had spontaneously sent envoys to the continent, and asked him for peace, they had attacked him without provocation, but said that he would pardon their ignorance and demanded hostages. Part of the required number they handed over at once, saying that they had to fetch the rest from long distances, and would deliver them in a few days. Meanwhile they ordered their followers to go back to their districts, while chiefs began to come in from all parts, and place themselves and their tribes under Caesar's protection. Peace had been thus established when, three days after the expedition reached Britain, the eighteen ships mentioned above, which had taken the cavalry on board, sailed from the upper port with a light breeze. They were getting close to Britain, and were seen from the camp, when such a violent storm suddenly arose that none of them could keep their course, but some were carried back to the point from which they had started, while the others were swept down in great peril to the lower and more westerly part of the island. They anchored, notwithstanding, but as they were becoming waterlogged, were forced to stand out to sea in the face of night and make for the continent. The same night it happened to be full moon, which generally causes very high tides in the ocean, a fact of which our men were not aware. The result was that the galleys, in which Caesar had brought over troops, and which he had drawn up on dry land, were waterlogged, while the transports which were at anchor were damaged by the storm, and the men were unable to be of any service or go to their assistance. Several ships were wrecked, the rest were rendered useless by the loss of their rigging, anchors, and other fittings, and naturally the whole army was seized by panic. There were no other ships to take them back. Everything required for repairing ships was lacking, and as the troops all understood that they would have to winter in Gaul, no corn for the winter had been provided on the spot. When this became known, the British chiefs who had waited on Caesar after the battle took counsel together. They knew that the Romans had neither cavalry nor ships nor grain, and they gathered that their troops were few from the smallness of the camp, which, as Caesar had taken over the legions without heavy baggage, was extraordinarily contracted. They therefore concluded that their best course would be to renew hostilities, cut off our men from corn and other supplies, and protract the campaign till winter, being confident that, if they overpowered them or prevented their return, no invader would ever again come over to Britain. Accordingly, they renewed their oaths of mutual fidelity, and began to move away one by one from the camp, and to fetch their tribesmen secretly from the districts. 
Caesar was not yet aware of their plans, but from what had happened to his ships, and from the fact that the chiefs had left off sending hostages, he guessed what was coming. Accordingly, he prepared for all contingencies. He had corn brought in daily from the fields into camp, utilized the timber and bronze belonging to the ships that had been most severely damaged to repair the rest, and ordered everything required for the purpose to be brought over from the continent. The men worked with hearty good will, and thus, although twelve ships were lost, he managed to have the rest made tolerably seaworthy. Meanwhile, a legion, known as the Seventh, was sent out in the ordinary course to fetch corn. So far no one had suspected that hostilities were brewing, for some of the natives still remained in the districts, while others were actually passing in and out of the camp. But the troops on guard in front of the gates of the camp reported to Caesar that an unusual amount of dust was to be seen in the direction in which the legion had gone. Suspecting, with good reason as it happened, that the natives had hatched some scheme, Caesar ordered the cohorts on guard to accompany him in the direction indicated, two of the others to relieve them and the rest to arm and follow him immediately. He had advanced some little distance from the camp when he observed that his troops were hard-pressed by the enemy and could barely hold their own, the legion being huddled together and missiles hurled in from all sides. All the corn had been cut except in this one spot, and the enemy, anticipating that the Romans would come here, had laid in wait in the woods during the night. Then, when the troops had laid aside their weapons and were dispersed and busy reaping, they had suddenly fallen upon them. A few were killed. The rest, whose ranks were not properly formed, were thrown into confusion, and the enemy's horse and war chariots had at the same time encompassed them. Chariots are used in action in the following way. First of all, the charioteers drive all over the field, the warriors hurling missiles, and generally they throw the enemy's ranks into confusion by the mere terror inspired by their horses and the clatter of the wheels. As soon as they have penetrated between the troops of cavalry, the warriors jump off the chariots and fight on foot. The drivers, meanwhile, gradually withdraw from the action and range the cars in such a position that, if the warriors are hard-pressed by the enemy's numbers, they may easily get back to them. Thus they exhibit in action the mobility of cavalry combined with the steadiness of infantry, and they become so efficient from constant practice and training that they will drive their horses at full gallop, keeping them well in hand down a steep incline check and turn them in an instant, run along the pole, stand on the yoke, and step backwards again to the cars with the greatest nimbleness. Our men were unnerved by these movements because the tactics were new to them, and Caesar came to their support in the nick of time. When he came up, the enemy stood still, and our men recovered from their alarm. Thinking, however, that the moment was not favorable for challenging the enemy and forcing on a battle, he simply maintained his position, and, after a short interval, withdrew the legions into camp. During these operations our people were all busy, and the rest of the Britons who were still in their districts left them. Stormy weather followed for several days running, which kept the troops in camp, and prevented the enemy from attacking. Meantime the natives sent messengers in all directions, telling their tribesmen that our troops were few, and pointing out that they had an excellent opportunity for plundering and establishing their independence for good by driving the Romans from their camp. By these representations they speedily got together a large body of horse and foot, and advanced against the camp. Caesar foresaw that what had happened on previous days would happen again. Even if the enemy were beaten, their mobility would enable them to get off scot-free. However, he luckily obtained about thirty horsemen, whom the Atrebatian Comius, already mentioned, had taken over with him, and drew up the legions in front of the camp. A battle followed, and the enemy, unable to stand long against the onset of our troops, turned and fled. The troops pursued them as far as their speed and endurance would permit, and killed a good many of them, then, after burning all the buildings far and wide, they returned to camp. On the same day, the enemy sent envoys who came to Caesar to sue for peace. 
he ordered them to find twice as many hostages as before and take them across to the continent for the equinox was near and as his ships were unsound he did not think it wise to risk a stormy passage taking advantage of favorable weather he set sail a little after midnight all the ships reached the continent in safety but two transports were unable to make the same harbors as the rest and drifted a little further down about three hundred infantry had landed from these two vessels and were making the best of their way to camp when the morini who had been quite submissive when caesar left them on his departure for britain surrounded them in the hope of plunder and told them if they did not want to be killed to lay down their arms the marini were not very numerous at first but when the soldiers formed square and defended themselves about six thousand hearing the uproar quickly assembled on receiving the news caesar sent all his cavalry from camp to rescue his men meanwhile our soldiers sustained the enemy's onslaught and fought most gallantly for more than four hours a few of them were wounded but they killed many of their assailants after our cavalry came in sight the enemy threw away their arms and fled and a large number of them were cut to pieces next day caesar sent titus labienus in command of the legions which he had brought back from britain to punish the rebellious morini the marshes which had served them as a refuge in the previous year were dried up and having no place to escape to almost all of them fell into the hands of labienus Quintus Titurius and Lucius Cotta, the generals who had led the other legions into the country of the Menapii, finding that they had all taken refuge in the thickest part of their forests, ravaged all their lands, cut their corn, burned their homesteads, and returned to Caesar, who quartered all the legions for the winter in the country of the Belgi. Thither two British tribes, and no more, sent hostages. The rest neglected to do so. In honor of these achievements, the Senate, on receiving caesar's dispatches appointed a thanksgiving service of twenty days end of chapter thirty eight chapters one to fourteen of commentaries on the gallic war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar, translated by Thomas Rice Holmes. Book Five, Caesar's Second Invasion of Britain, the Disaster at Aduatuca, Quintus Cicero at Bay, the Doom of Indutiomarus. Chapter One, When Caesar, according to his yearly custom, was leaving his winter quarters for Italy in the consulship of lucius domitius and appius claudius he ordered the generals whom he had placed in command of the legions to have as many ships as possible built during the winter and the old ones repaired he explained the principle and indicated the lines on which they were to be built to enable them to be loaded rapidly and hauled up on shore he had them made a little shallower than those which are habitually used in the mediterranean especially as he found that owing to the frequent ebb and flow of the tides the waves there are comparatively small on the other hand to carry stores as well as the numerous horses he built them a little wider than those which we use in other waters all these vessels he ordered to be constructed both for rowing and sailing which was greatly facilitated by their low freeboard and the tackle required for fitting them out to be imported from spain after finishing the assizes in cisalpine gaul he started for Illyricum, hearing that the Pirusti were making devastating raids upon the adjacent part of the province. On his arrival, he levied troops from the tribes and ordered them to concentrate at a prescribed place. The Pirusti, on hearing of this, sent envoys to tell him that the authorities were not responsible for anything that had occurred, and declared themselves ready to make full reparation. After listening to what the envoys had to say, caesar ordered them to furnish hostages who were to be brought to him by a fixed date warning them that in default of compliance he would attack the tribe the hostages were brought punctually in obedience to his orders and he appointed umpires to weigh the matters in dispute between the several tribes and settle the fines two 
after disposing of these affairs and finishing the assizes caesar returned to cisalpina gaul and thence started to join the army on his arrival he inspected all the camps and found that thanks to the extraordinary energy of the troops and notwithstanding the extreme deficiency of resources about six hundred ships of the class described above and twenty-eight galleys had been built and would be ready for launching in a few days heartily commending the soldiers and the officers who had superintended the work he gave the necessary instructions and ordered all the ships to assemble at the ischian harbour from which he had ascertained that the passage to britain was most convenient the run from the continent being about thirty miles leaving an adequate number of troops to effect this movement he started with four legions in light marching order and eight hundred horse for the country of the treveri as they would not attend his counsels or submit to his authority and were said to be making overtures to the transrenanate germans three this tribe possesses by far the most powerful cavalry in the whole of gaul as well as numerous infantry and as we have remarked above its territory reaches the rhine two rivals in Dushomerus and Singeterix, were engaged in a struggle for supremacy. The latter, as soon as the approach of Caesar and his legions was known, presented himself before him, gave an assurance that he and all his followers would remain staunch and not break off their friendship with the Romans, and told him what was going on amongst the Treveri. In Dushomerus, on the other hand, proceeded to levy horse and foot and to make preparations for war while he sent those who were not of an age to bear arms into the ardennes a forest of vast extent which stretches from the rhine through the heart of the treveran territory to the frontier of the remy some leading men however of the former tribe influenced by friendship for singeterex and alarmed by the arrival of our army came to caesar and feeling unable to do anything for their country began to proffer petitions on their own behalf thereupon into Shomerus, afraid of being left in the lurch sent envoys to caesar to say that he had only refrained from leaving his followers and presenting himself before him in order to keep the tribe loyal lest if all the men of rank left them the masses in their ignorance might fall away accordingly the people were under his control and if caesar would allow him he would wait upon him in his camp and entrust his own interests and those of his community to his protection Four caesar was aware of his motive for saying this and of the circumstances that deterred him from prosecuting his design still in order to avoid having to waste the summer in the country of the treveri after having made all his preparations for a campaign in britain he told in Dushomerus to present himself with two hundred hostages when they were brought amongst them being a son of Dushomerus and all his relations whom caesar had summoned expressly he spoke to him kindly and urged him to remain staunch nevertheless he summoned the leading men of the treveri and called upon them individually to support singeterix he felt that singeterix deserved this service at his hands and at the same time he thought it most important that a man of whose remarkable good will towards himself he had clear evidence should as far as possible command the respect of his own countrymen in Dushomerus bitterly resented this action as diminishing his own credit and whereas he had already been ill-disposed towards us this grievance kindled his indignation into a fiercer flame five after settling these affairs caesar moved with the legions to the ischian harbour there he learned that sixty ships which had been built in the country of the meldi had been driven back by stress of weather and failing to keep their course had returned to the point from which they had started the rest he found completely fitted out and ready for sea some four thousand cavalry from the whole of gaul and the leading men from all the tribes assembled at the same place a few of them whose fidelity he was assured he had determined to leave in gaul taking the rest with him as hostages as he was afraid that during his absence there would be disturbances in the country six amongst the other hostages was the eduan dumnerix of whom we have already spoken caesar had determined to keep this man particularly under his eye because he knew him to be an ardent revolutionary fond of power a man of masterful character and possessing great influence with the gauls moreover 
Dumnorix had stated in the Eduan Council that Caesar was going to confer upon him the sovereignty over the tribe, and the Edui were seriously offended at this remark, and yet did not venture to send envoys to Caesar to protest or to depreciate his intention. Caesar had learned this from natives who were his friends. Dumnorix at first earnestly prayed for leave to remain in Gaul, partly on the ground that he was not accustomed to being on board ship and dreaded the sea, partly, as he alleged, because he was debarred by religious obligations. Finding that his request was steadily refused and that there was no hope of getting Caesar's consent, he began to importune the Gallic magnates, taking them aside one by one and urging them to remain on the continent. He wrought upon their fears. He told them that there was some strong reason for robbing Gaul of all her men of rank. Caesar shrank from putting them to death under the eyes of their countrymen but his purpose was to take them all over to Britain and there murder them. He made them promise to stay, and called upon them to swear that they would unite in carrying out the policy which they saw to be for the interest of Gaul. These intrigues were reported to Caesar by numerous informants. 7. Having learned the facts, he determined, inasmuch as it was his policy to treat the Adui with special distinction, that it was his duty to coerce and intimidate Dumnorix by every means in his power, and, as his frenzy was evidently passing all bounds, to see that he did no injury to himself personally or to the public interest. For about twenty-five days he was kept waiting in the port, because the northwest wind, which commonly blows throughout a great part of the year on these coasts, made it impossible to sail. Accordingly he did his best to keep Dumnorix steady but at the same time to acquaint himself with all his plans. At length, taking advantage of favorable weather, he ordered the infantry and cavalry to embark. While everybody's attention was distracted, Dumnorix, accompanied by the Eduan cavalry, left the camp without Caesar's knowledge, and started for his own country. On receiving the news, Caesar broke off his departure, postponed all his arrangements, and sending a strong detachment of cavalry to pursue Dumnorix, ordered him to be brought back, and, in case he resisted and refused to submit, to be put to death, for he thought that a man who disregarded his authority when he was present would not behave rationally in his absence. When called upon to return he resisted, defended himself with vigor, and adjured his retainers to be true to him, crying loudly and repeatedly that he was a free man and belonged to a free people. The cavalry, in obedience to orders, surrounded the fellow and put him to death but the eduan cavalry all returned to caesar eight having disposed of this business caesar leaving labienus on the continent with three legions and two thousand cavalry to protect the ports provide for a supply of corn ascertain what was passing in gaul and act as the circumstances of the moment might dictate set sail towards the sunset with five legions and the same number of cavalry as he had left behind a light southwesterly breeze wafted him on his way, but about midnight the wind dropped. He failed to keep his course, and, drifting far away with the tide, he descried Britain at daybreak lying behind on the port quarter. Then, following the turn of the tide, he rode hard to gain the part of the island where, as he had learned in the preceding summer, it was best to land. Footnote. Between Deal Castle and Sandwich a little north of where he landed in 55 B.C. End footnote. The energy shown by the soldiers on this occasion was most praiseworthy. Rowing hard without a break they kept up in their heavily laden transports with the ships of war. The ships all reached Britain about midday, but no enemy was visible. Large numbers, as Caesar found out afterwards from prisoners, had assembled on the spot, but, alarmed by the great number of ships, more than 800 of which, conning those of the preceding year and the private vessels which individuals had built for their own convenience were visible at once they had quitted the shore and withdrawn to the higher ground nine caesar disembarked the army and chose a suitable spot for a camp footnote perhaps on the gently rising ground near worth End footnote. having ascertained from prisoners where the enemy's forces were posted he left ten cohorts and three hundred cavalry near the sea to protect the ships, and marched against the enemy about the third watch. He felt little anxiety for the ships, as he was leaving them at anchor on a nice open shore, 
the ships and the detachment which protected them were placed under the command of Quintus Atrius. After a night march of about twelve miles, Caesar described the enemy's force. Advancing with their cavalry and chariots from higher ground towards a river, they attempted to check our men and force on an action. Footnote. The river was the Great Star, and Caesar crossed it near Canterbury, probably at Thannington. End footnote. Beaten off by the cavalry, they fell back into the woods and occupied a well-fortified post of great natural strength, which they had apparently prepared for defense some time before with a view to intestine war, for all the entrances were blocked by felled trees laid close together. Footnote. Probably Bigbury Camp, about a mile and a half west of Canterbury, traces of which still exist. End footnote. Fighting in scattered groups, they threw missiles from the woods, and tried to prevent our men from penetrating within the defences. But the soldiers of the Seventh Legion, locking their shields over their heads, and piling up lumber against the defences, captured the position and drove them out of the woods at the cost of a few wounded. Caesar, however, forbade them to pursue the fugitives far, partly because he had no knowledge of the ground, partly because much of the day was spent and he wished to leave time for entrenching his camp. 10. On the following morning he sent a light force of infantry and cavalry, in three columns, to pursue the fugitives. They had advanced a considerable distance, the rear guard being just in sight, when some troopers from Quintus Atrius came to Caesar with the news that there had been a great storm on the preceding night, and that almost all the ships had been damaged and gone ashore, as the anchors and the cables did not hold, and the seamen and their captains could not cope with the force of the storm. The collisions between different vessels had therefore caused heavy loss. 11. On receiving this information, Caesar recalled the legions and cavalry, ordering them to defend themselves as they marched, and went back himself to the ships. He saw with his own eyes much the same as he had learned from the messengers and the dispatch which they brought. About forty ships were lost, but it seemed possible to repair the rest, though at cost of considerable trouble. Accordingly, he selected skilled workmen from the legions and ordered others to be sent for from the continent, at the same time writing to tell Labienus to build as many ships as possible with the legions under his command. Although it involved great trouble and labor, he decided that the best plan would be to have all the ships hauled up and connected with the camp by one entrenchment. About ten days were spent in these operations, the troops not suspending work even in the night. As soon as the ships were hauled up and the camp strongly fortified, Caesar left the same force as before to protect them, and advanced to the point from which he had returned. By the time that he arrived, reinforcements of Britons had assembled on the spot from all sides. The chief command and the general direction of the campaign had been entrusted by common consent to Castavalanus, whose territories are separated from those of the maritime tribes by a river called the Thames, about eighty miles from the sea. He had therefore been incessantly at war with the other tribes. But, in their alarm at our arrival, the Britons had made him commander-in-chief. 12. The interior of Britain is inhabited by a people who, according to oral tradition, so the Britons themselves say are aboriginal. The maritime districts by immigrants who crossed over from Belgium to plunder, and attack the aborigines, almost all of them being called after the tribes from whom the first comers were an offshoot. When the war was over they remained in the country and settled down as tillers of the soil. The population is immense. Homesteads, closely resembling those of the Gauls, are met with at every turn, and cattle are very numerous. Gold coins are in use, or, instead of coins, iron bars of fixed weight. Tin is found in the country in the inland, and iron in the maritime districts, but the latter only in small quantities. Bronze is imported. Trees exist of all the varieties which occur in Gaul, except the beech and the fir. Hares, fowls, and geese they think it impious to taste, but they keep them for pastime or amusement. The climate is more equitable than in Gaul, the cold being less severe. 13. The island is triangular in shape, one side being opposite Gaul. One corner of this side, by Kent, the landing place for almost all the ships from Gaul, has an easterly, and the lower one a southerly aspect. The extent of this side is about five hundred miles. The second trends westward towards Spain. 
off the coast there is Ireland, which is considered only half as large as Britain, though the passage is equal in length to that between Britain and Gaul. Halfway across is an island called Man, and several smaller islands also are believed to be situated opposite this coast, in which, according to some writers, there is continuous night, about the winter solstice, for thirty days. Our inquiries could elicit no information on the subject, but by accurate measurements with a water clock we could see that the nights were shorter than on the continent. The length of this side, according to the estimate of the natives, is seven hundred miles. The third side has a northerly aspect, and no land lies opposite it. Its corner, however, looks, if anything, in the direction of Germany. The length of this side is estimated at eight hundred miles. Thus the whole island is two thousand miles in circumference. 14. By far the most civilized of all the natives are the inhabitants of Kent, a purely maritime district, whose culture does not differ much from that of the Gauls. The people of the interior do not, for the most part, cultivate grain, but live on milk and flesh meat and clothe themselves with skins. All the Britons, without exception, stain themselves with woad, which produces a bluish tint. This gives them a wild look in battle. They wear their hair long, and shave the whole of their body except the head and the upper lip. Groups of ten or twelve men have wives in common, brothers generally sharing with each other and fathers with their sons. The offspring of these unions are counted as the children of the man to whose home the mother, as a virgin, was originally taken. End of chapter 14「Commentaries on the Gallic War」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « Commentaries on the Gallic War » by Julius Caesar Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes Book 5, Chapter 15 the enemy's horsemen and charioteers kept up a fierce running fight with their cavalry, the latter, however, getting the best of it at all points, and driving the enemy into the woods and onto the hills. They killed a good many, but, pursuing too eagerly, lost some of their own number. After a time, while our men were off their guard and occupied in entrenching their camp, the enemy suddenly dashed out of the woods, swooped down upon the outpost in front of the camp and engaged it in a hot combat, and when Caesar sent two cohorts, the first of their respective legions, to the rescue, which were separated from each other by a very small interval, our men were unnerved by tactics which were new to them, and they boldly charged between the two and got back unhurt. Quintus Liberius Durus, a military tribune, was killed that day. After additional cohorts had been sent up, the enemy were beaten off. 16. Throughout this peculiar combat, which was fought in full view of every one and actually in front of the camp, it was clear that the infantry, owing to the weight of their armor, were ill-fitted to engage an enemy of this kind, for they could not pursue him when he retreated, and they dared not abandon their regular formation. Also that the cavalry fought at great risk, because the enemy generally fell back on purpose, and, after drawing our men a little distance away from the legions, leaped down from their chariots and fought on foot with the odds in their favor. On the other hand, the mode in which their cavalry fought exposed the Romans, alike in retreat and in pursuit, to an exactly similar danger. Footnote. Caesar probably meant that the mode in which the British cavalry fought, in cooperation with the charioteers, exposed the Romans, alike in retreat and in pursuit, to exactly the same danger. End footnote. Besides, the Britons never fought in masses, but in groups separated by wide intervals. They posted reserves and relieved each other in succession, fresh vigorous men taking the places of those who were tired. 17. Next day the enemy occupied a position on the heights at a distance from the camp, and began to show themselves in scattered groups and harass our cavalry but with less vigor than the day before. At midday, however, Caesar having sent three legions and all his cavalry on a foraging expedition under one of his generals, Gaines Trebonius, 
they suddenly swooped down from all points on the foragers, not hesitating to attack the ordered ranks of the legions. The men charged them vigorously, beat them off, and continued to pursue them until the cavalry, relying upon the support of the legions, which they saw behind them, drove them headlong. They killed a great many of them and never allowed them to rally or make a stand or get down from their chariots. After this rout the reinforcements, which had assembled from all sides, immediately dispersed, and from that time the enemy never encountered us in a general action. 18. Having ascertained the enemy's plans, Caesar led his army to the Thames, into the territories of Cassivellaunus. The river can only be forded at one spot, and there with difficulty. On reaching this place, he observed that the enemy were drawn up in great force near the opposite bank of the river. The bank was fenced by sharp stakes planted along its edge, and similar stakes were fixed under water and concealed by the river. Having learned these facts from prisoners and deserters, Caesar sent his cavalry on in front, and ordered the legions to follow them speedily. But the men advanced with such swiftness and dash, though they only had their heads above water, that the enemy, unable to withstand the combined onset of infantry and cavalry, quitted the bank and fled. 19. Cassivellaunus, abandoning, as we have remarked above, all thoughts of regular combat, disbanded the greater part of his force, retaining only about four thousand charioteers, watched our line of march, and, moving a little way from the track, concealed himself in impenetrable wooded spots and removed the cattle and inhabitants from the open country into the woods in those districts through which he had learned that we intended to march. Whenever our cavalry made a bold dash into the country to plunder and devastate, he sent his charioteers out of the woods, for he was familiar with every track and path, engaged the cavalry to their great peril, and by the fear which he thus inspired prevented them from moving far afield. Caesar now had no choice but to forbid them to move out of touch with the column of infantry, and, by ravaging the country and burning villages, to injure the enemy as far as the legionnaires' powers of endurance would allow. 20. Meanwhile the Trinovantes, about the strongest tribe in that part of the country, sent envoys to Caesar, promising to surrender and obey his commands. Mandibrasius, a young chief of this tribe, whose father had been their king and had been put to death by Cassivellaunus, but who saved his own life by flight, had gone to the continent to join Caesar, and thrown himself upon his protection. The Trinovantes begged Caesar to protect Mandibrasius from harm at the hands of Cassivellaunus, and to send him to rule over his own people with full powers. Caesar sent Mandibrasius, but ordered them to furnish forty hostages and grain for his army. They promptly obeyed his commands, sending hostages to the number required and also the grain. 21. As the Trinovantes had been granted protection and immunity from all injury on the part of the soldiers, the Senemagni, Segontiasi, and Calites, Bibrosi, and Cassi sent embassies to Caesar and surrendered. Footnote. The Senemagni were perhaps identical with the Essene or Isseni, who inhabited Suffolk and Norfolk. The Segontiasi may have been conterminous with, and were probably north of, the Atrebates, who occupied parts of Hampshire and Berkshire. The Bibrosi may have dwelt in Berkshire. All that is known about the geographical position of the Ancolites and Cassi is that they lived somewhere in the basin of the Thames, west or possibly north of the Trinovantian territory in Essex. End footnote. He learned from the envoys that the stronghold of Cassivellaunus, which was protected by woods and marshes, was not far off, and that a considerable number of men and of cattle had assembled in it. The Britons apply the name of stronghold to any woodland spot, difficult of access and fortified with a rampart and trench, to which they are in the habit of resorting in order to escape a hostile raid. Caesar marched to the spot indicated with his legions and found that the place was of great natural strength and well fortified. Nevertheless he proceeded to assault it on two sides. The enemy stood their ground a short time, but could not sustain the onset of our infantry, and fled precipitately from another part of the stronghold. A great quantity of cattle was found in the place, 
and many of the garrison were captured as they were trying to escape, and killed. 22. While the operations above mentioned were going on in this district, Cassivellaunus sent envoys to Kent, which, as we have remarked above, is close to the sea, ordering Singetonks, Carvilius, Taximugulus, and Segovax, the four kings who ruled over the country, to collect all their forces, and make a sudden descent upon the naval camp, and attack it. When they reached the camp, the officers made a sortie, killed many of them, captured their leader Legotorix, a man of rank, and withdrew their men without loss. On receiving news of the action, Cassivellaunus, who was greatly alarmed by the defection of the tribes, following the numerous disasters which he had sustained and the ravaging of his country, availed himself of the mediation of the attribation, Commius, and sent envoys to Caesar to propose surrender. Caesar had resolved to winter on the continent, because disturbances were likely to break out suddenly in Gaul. Not much of the summer remained, and the enemy, as he knew, could easily spin out the time. Accordingly, he ordered hostages to be given, and fixed the tribute which Britain was to pay annually to the Roman people, at the same time strictly forbidding Cassivellaunus to molest Mandabrasius or the Trinovantes. 23. On receiving the hostages, he led back the army to the sea, where he found the ships repaired. When they were launched, he arranged to take the army back in two trips, as he had a large number of prisoners and some ships had been destroyed by the storm. It so happened that of all this numerous fleet, after so many voyages, not a single vessel conveying troops was lost either in this or in the preceding year, while of the ships that were empty, comprising those which had landed troops after the first trip and were sent back to Caesar from the continent, and sixty others which Labienus had constructed after the wreck, only a very few reached their destination, nearly all the rest being driven back. Caesar waited for them a considerable time in vain, and then, for fear the lateness of the season, just before the equinox, should prevent his sailing, he was obliged to pack the troops rather closely. A dead calm followed, and unmooring at the beginning of the second watch, he reached land at dawn and brought all the ships safe ashore. End of chapter 23《Chapters 24 to 37 of Commentaries on the Gallic War》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes Book 5, Chapter 24 the harvest that year in Gaul had been scanty on account of drought, and accordingly, after beaching the ships and holding a council of the Gallic deputies at Samarobrava, Caesar was compelled to quarter the army for the winter on a different principle from that which he had followed in former years, distributing the legions among several tribes. He assigned one of them to Gaius Fabius, one of his generals, another to Quintus Cicero, and a third to Lucius Rossius with orders to march them into the countries of the Morini, the Nervii, and the Esuvii, respectively, quartered the fourth under Titus Labienus in the country of the Remi, just on the frontier of the Treveri, and stationed three in Belgium under the command of the Quistor, Marcus Crassus, and two generals, Lucius Monatius Plancus and Gaius Trebonius. A single legion, which he had recently raised north of the Po, was sent, along with five cohorts, into the country of the Eburones, a people ruled by Ambiorix and Catuvolcus, the greater part of whose territory is between the Meuse and the Rhine. Quintus Titurius Sabinus and Lucius Anruncaliaus Cotta were ordered to take command of these troops. This method of distributing the legions Caesar regarded as the easiest way of remedying the scarcity of corn. And in fact the quarters of all the legions, except the one which he had sent under Lucius Rossius into a perfectly tranquil and undisturbed district, were enclosed within an area whose extreme points were only one hundred miles apart. Caesar determined to remain himself in Gaul until he ascertained that the legions were in their several positions and their camps entrenched. 25. 
Among the Carnatus was a man of noble birth, named Tesgetius, whose ancestors had held sovereignty in their own country, and to whom Caesar, in recognition of his energy and devotion, for in all his campaigns he had found his services exceptionally valuable, had restored their position. He was now in the third year of his reign when his enemies, with the avowed sanction of many of the citizens, assassinated him. The crime was reported to Caesar. Fearing that, as many were implicated, the tribe might be impelled by them to revolt, he ordered Lucius Plancus to march rapidly with his legion from Belgium into the country of the Carnatus, winter there, and arrest and send to him the individuals whom he found responsible for Tasgetius's death. Meanwhile he was informed by all the officers under whose command he had placed the legions, that they had reached their respective quarters and that the positions were entrenched. 26. About fifteen days after the positions had been taken up, a sudden and alarming revolt was started by Ambiorix and Catuvolcus. They had waited upon Sabinus and Calta at the frontier of their kingdom and conveyed the corn to the camp, when, egged on by emissaries from the Treveran, in Dushomerus, they roused their tribesmen, suddenly overpowered a fatigue party who were cutting wood, and came with a large force to attack the camp. Our men speedily armed and mounted the rampart. Some Spanish horse were sent out from one side and came off victorious in a cavalry combat, and the enemy, seeing the futility of their attempt, called off their troops. Then, after the manner of their nation, they shouted for some one on our side to go out and parley with them, declaring that they had something to say, affecting both sides, which, they hoped, might settle disputes. 27. Gaius Arpinius, a Roman knight, who was intimate with Quintus Titanus, was sent to confer with them, accompanied by one Quintus Junius, a Spaniard, who had been in the habit of visiting Ambiorix as Caesar's representative. Ambiorix addressed them in the following terms. He would admit that he was deeply indebted to Caesar for various acts of kindness, having by his good offices been relieved of tribute which he had regularly paid to his neighbors, the Aduatusi while his own son and his brothers, who had been sent to them as hostages and by them enslaved and imprisoned, had been sent back by Caesar. Moreover, in attacking the camp, he had not acted spontaneously or on his own judgment, but under the compulsion of the tribe, his sovereignty being so far limited that the multitude had no less power over him than he over them. Furthermore, the tribe had only taken up arms because it was unable to resist a sudden conspiracy on the part of the Gauls. This he could easily prove from his own insignificance for he was not so ignorant of affairs as to imagine that his troops could get the better of the Roman people. Gaul, however, was unanimous that very day had been fixed for a general attack on Caesar's camps, to prevent any one legion from assisting another. It was not easy for Gauls to refuse help to their countrymen especially as the object of the movement was, of course, to recover national liberty. However, having done his duty to them on the score of patriotism, he now thought of what he owed to Caesar for his favors. He therefore urged, nay, implored, Titurius, as a friend whose salt he had eaten, to consider his own and his soldiers' safety. A large force of German mercenaries had crossed the Rhine, and would be at hand in a couple of days. It was for the Roman generals to decide whether they would withdraw their troops from camp before the neighboring tribes could find out, and transfer them either to Cicero or to Lebeinus, the former of whom was about fifty miles off, the latter rather more. He would solemnly promise on oath to grant them a safe conduct through his territory. In so doing he was acting in the interests of his tribe, which would be relieved from the burden of the camp, and showing his gratitude for Caesar's services. After this speech Ambiorix withdrew. 28. Arpinius and Junius reported to the generals what they had heard. The suddenness of the news made them anxious, and although it came from an enemy, they did not think it wise to disregard it. What most alarmed them was that it seemed hardly credible that an obscure and insignificant tribe like the Eburones would have ventured to make war upon the Roman people on their own account. Accordingly they referred the question to a council of war, and a violent dispute arose between them, 
Lucius Anrenculius and many of the tribunes and chief centurions held that it would not be right to take any step without due consideration or to leave the camp without authority from Caesar. They pointed out that, as the camp was fortified, it was possible to hold out against any force, even of Germans. Experience proved this for they had resolutely sustained the enemy's first onslaught and inflicted heavy loss upon him into the bargain. They were not pressed for supplies and reinforcements would arrive in time from the nearest camp and from Caesar himself. Finally, what could be more puerile or more unsoldierlike than to make a momentous decision on the advice of an enemy? 29. In opposition to these arguments, Titurius loudly insisted that it would be too late to act when the enemy's reinforcements had arrived with their German allies, or the nearest camp had suffered a disaster. The time for deliberation was short. Caesar, so he believed, had started for Italy, otherwise the Carnatus would not have dreamed of putting Tasgetius to death, nor, if Caesar had been at hand, would the Eburones have held our men so cheap as to attack the camp. It was not to the enemy that he looked for guidance, but to facts. The Rhine was close by. The Germans were embittered by the death of Ariovistus and our earlier victories. Gaul was ablaze with indignation at all the indignities she had suffered, at her subjugation to the dominion of the Roman people, and at the eclipse of her former military renown. Finally, who could persuade himself that Ambiorix had ventured upon an enterprise like this without solid support? His advice was safe either way if nothing untoward happened. They would get to the nearest legion without any danger. If the whole of Gaul were in league with the Germans their only safety was in prompt action. As to Cotta and those who took the opposite view, what would be the result of following their counsel? It involved, if not immediate danger, at all events the prospect of a long blockade accompanied by famine. 30. Such were the arguments on both sides, and, as Cotta and the chief centurions continued to oppose him vehemently, Sabinus, raising his voice, so that a large number of the soldiers might hear, cried, Have your own way, if you like. Death has no more terrors for me than for you. The men will judge, and if any disaster happens, they'll call you to account for it, whereas if you, Cotta, would consent, on the day after tomorrow they would join their comrades in the nearest camp and share the fortune of war with them, instead of perishing by the sword or by famine, like outcasts far removed from their fellows. 31. The assembled officers stood up. They took the two generals by the hand and implored them not to precipitate a disaster by quarreling and obstinacy. Go or stay, everything could be managed if only they were all unanimous. But no good, that they could see, would come from quarreling. The dispute dragged on till midnight. At length Cotta, overborne by superior authority, gave way. Sabinus's view prevailed. An order was issued that the troops were to march at daybreak. The men stayed up for the rest of the night, every one looking about to see what he could take with him, what part of his winner's kit he would be forced to leave behind. Men thought of every argument to persuade themselves that they could not remain without danger, and that the danger would be increased by protracted watches and consequent exhaustion. At dawn they marched out of camp, like men convinced that the Ambiorix who had counseled them was no enemy but the best of friends, in a column of extraordinary length and with an immense baggage train. Footnote. Sabinus was the senior officer. End footnote. 32. The enemy, perceiving from the hum of voices in the night and the Romans remaining up that they had resolved to go, stationed themselves in ambush in two divisions in the woods, in a convenient position, screened from observation, about two miles off to await their arrival, and when the bulk of the column had moved down into a large defile, they suddenly showed themselves on either side of it, hustled forward the rear guard, checked the ascent of the van, and forced on a combat on a spot most unfavorable for our men. 33. And now Titurius, having exercised no forethought, lost all nerve, ran from place to place, and tried to get the cohorts into formation but he did this nervously and in such a way that one could see that he was at his wit's end, as indeed generally happens to men who are forced to decide on the spur of the moment. 
Cotta, on the other hand, who had foreseen that these things might happen on the march, and for that reason had declined to sanction the movement, was fully equal to the occasion. He performed a general's part in calling upon the men and encouraging them, and in action he did the work of a private soldier. Owing to the length of the column, it was not easy for the generals to look to everything themselves and make the necessary arrangements for every part of the field. They therefore ordered the word to be given to abandon the baggage and form in a square. Although, in the circumstances, the plan cannot be condemned, its effect was nevertheless disastrous, for, as it would evidently not have been resorted to but for extreme anxiety and despair, it made our soldiers despondent and stimulated the enemy's ardor for battle. Moreover, as was inevitable, soldiers were everywhere abandoning their companies, every one hurrying to the baggage train to look for his most cherished possessions and carry them off, while the whole field was a scene of weeping and uproar. 34. The natives, on their part, showed no lack of resource. Their leaders ordered the word to be passed along the line that no man was to stir from his post. The booty was their prize, and whatever the Romans left was to be kept for them. They were to remember, then, that everything depended upon victory. Our men were as brave as they and not overmatched in point of numbers. Forsaken by their leader and by fortune, they trusted for safety to courage alone, and as often as a cohort charged, there many of the enemy fell. Observing this, Ambiorix ordered the word to be given for the tribesmen to throw their missiles from a distance and not go too close. Whenever the Romans charged, they were to fall back. Being lightly armed and in constant training, they could not suffer. When the Romans attempted to rejoin their companies, they were to pursue. 35. The order was carefully obeyed. Whenever a cohort left the square and charged, the enemy ran swiftly away. Meanwhile the cohort was necessarily exposed, and missiles fell on its unshielded flank. When the men began to return to the position they had left, they were surrounded by the enemy who stood near them as well as by those who had fallen back. If, on the other hand, they chose to hold their ground, there was no room for courage, and, being crowded together, they could not avoid the missiles hurled by that huge host. Yet, harassed by all these disadvantages and in spite of heavy loss, they held out, and threw out a combat which lasted the greater part of the day. From dawn till the eighth hour, they did nothing unworthy of themselves. At this moment Titus Balventius, who, in the previous year, had been chief centurion of his legion, a brave and highly respected man, had both his thighs pierced by a javelin. Quintus Lucanus, an officer of the same rank, while trying to save his son, who had been surrounded, was killed, fighting most gallantly, and Lucius Cotta, while cheering on all the cohorts and centuries, was struck full in the face by a stone from a sling. 36. Quintus Titurius was greatly agitated at the aspect of affairs, and descrying Ambiorix some way off haranguing his men, he sent his interpreter, Gnaeus Pompeius, to ask for quarter for himself and the troops. In reply to this appeal, Ambiorix said that Titurius might speak to him if he liked. He hoped that the host might be induced to consent as far as the safety of the troops was concerned. Titurius, at all events, should come to no harm, and for that he would pledge his word. Sabinus consulted the wounded Cotta, proposing that, if he approved, they should withdraw from the action and together confer with Ambiorix, who might, he hoped, be induced to spare both them and the troops. Cotta replied that he would not meet an armed enemy and to this resolve he adhered. 37. Sabinus ordered the tribunes and chief centurions whom he had round him at the moment to follow him. On approaching Ambiorix, he was ordered to lay down his arms, and obeyed, telling his officers to do the same. The principals were discussing about terms, and Ambiorix was purposely making a long speech, when Sabinus was gradually surrounded and slain. Then, in the native fashion, they shouted victory, and with a loud yell dashed into our ranks and broke them. Lucius Cotta fell fighting where he stood, and the bulk of the men with him. The rest retreated to the camp, whence they had come. Lucius Petrositaus, the standard-bearer, 
finding himself beset by a multitude of enemies, threw his eagle inside the rampart, and, fighting most gallantly in front of the camp, was slain. His comrades with difficulty sustained the onslaught till night. Then, seeing that hope was gone, they all slew each other to the last man. A few, who had slipped away from the battle, made their way by the woodland tracks to the quarters of Titus Labienus and told him what had occurred. End of chapter 37